Hello and welcome to the interview show. In this episode, I'll be talking to Matthew Holmes, the director of The Cost and The Legend of Ben Hall. Uh, we'll be talking about his films, making films in Australia, physical media, the state of media and film and the industry in Australia, and all that jazz. Enjoy. Matthew, welcome to that interview show. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's good to be on. Yeah. Um, so for the audience who don't know, Matthew is a local Australian uh, legend, soon to be, ideally. Um, he's a filmmaker and quite a talent at that. I have, of course, the two current films that you've released, The Cost and The Legend of Ben Hall, which you generously sent to me. Yeah, we'll, we'll start with... yeah we'll. Uh, we'll start with what got you into film, then we'll get to know you better, and then, yeah, we'll move on from there. So, okay. Um, films, yeah. What what got you into films? Your lovely shelf there and everything. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, you know, like many of us growing up with movies, you know, love movies. Um, but uh, I think what – I can't I can't really – I know around about when I was about 13 or 14, I realised that I really wanted to be – I really wanted to make movies. I've always been in, you know, into art and drawing and cartooning and animation, but movies was definitely, I think I had, um, I don't know, I just, I just knew that's where I wanted to go. So pretty much from that age, I, I've been focused on making movies in one way or another. So it was something that was, you know, got into me pretty quick. Um, as soon as I could get hold of an 8 mil camera or, you know, a video camera, I was making home movies with my brothers and sisters and things like that. There's some been really embarrassing um clips of those on youtube um of some of those attempts of, of my early childhood um uh, but look it's always been in me so once i you know I, I did i did films and animation and stuff during school i didn't do any further training in in um in, in filmmaking i just went straight into pretty much straight into the industry by uh getting a, a job at um a, a local animation company in adelaide and which was they did stop motion animation and so on. They they used to make the um the Schmackos commercials, the um home hardware dogalog yeah. commercials. So I got my foot in the door there through some work experience for year twelve, and then they invited me to come back and work for them casually. And I just spent the next few years like starting at the very very bottom, and you know sweeping floors and you know making little props and things like that, and working my way up to becoming a full time animator in that company. And I worked for there, and I worked there for nearly fifteen years. And uh, and and of course, during that time, making TV, TV commercials and and doing stop motion animation, I um, started making my own movies. Released my first feature film, Twin Rivers, in two thousand and seven. Took me six years to make it, and it was all funded by myself working a blockbuster video and uh, and working at Anifex as well. And um, yeah, and ever since then, I've just been just doing everything I can to, you know, finance and make movies. Yeah, that's good. Did you um study or do any university degree or whatnot, or have anything fancy? No, no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. I had didn't have any intention or, or desire to do further study on in film. I know <laughs> some people encourage me to do it, but I I, I um I've always been a, a, a kind of person who would rather just go out and do it and learn on the yeah. job. And getting into Anifex, that animation company, quite early and being around filmmakers and animators and making TV commercials, I was learning stuff on the job. Hmm. You know, I was learning how to, what to do on a film set and what a director does and storyboarding and shooting and lighting. And I was doing, I was, because I was around it every day almost, I was learning there. And I got to meet and rub shoulders with a lot of film industry people because of that. And so it was really sort of a on the job education that I got. And I was very fortunate that on my first film, Twin Rivers, about halfway through the production of it, I got introduced to, you know, legendary filmmaker Rolf Tahir. He was based in Adelaide at the time. And he kind of took me under his wing when the South Australian Film Corporation refused to put any money into Twin Rivers and help me get it finished. He took me under his wing and and sort of tutored and mentored me through the post-production process and recutting my movie, shaping it, um, you know, rewriting the voiceover. And and he sort of guided it through post-production and, and used his contacts to sort of get it made. So 
I got, you know, a good year and a half of, you know, education from Rolf to here, listening to him sitting in the edit suite and watching him sort of direct the edit and just picking up all his knowledge as well. So that sort of was my education in filmmaking. No, that's that's probably like I'd say that's better than what I've learned because <laughs> that's like the hands-on <laughs> stuff is always like the more impressive and you can always just, I know that, I know that because I've done it all before. Yeah, it's 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 good. It it's certainly good. helps, yeah. When you've done every aspect of production yourself, like I've done everything from costume, makeup, cinematography, set building, prop building. Like there's no part of a production I haven't had to do myself um, at one point or another. And it just informs, it helps inform you about what all the processes are and what everyone in the crew needs to do. So, you know, as a director, when you come to writing something or directing something, you have a pretty broad understanding of uh, what people have to go through. I even acted in Twin Rivers. I was the second lead in that. So I even know what it's like to be an actor. And so it was, um, you know, I think all those years were very much my formative sort of my formative years of learning. Uh, I, I considered my first film, Twin Rivers, to be my film school. It's my film school, my, my own film school project film. So uh, it hasn't been officially. Re I released it on Blu-ray um, myself, but um, it's not. It, had, it did have an official DVD release, you know, nearly 15 years ago, but and it was on Foxtel and so on. It's still available on Amazon Amazon Prime and places like that if anyone's interested to see it. So, Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, from there we can obviously go into your other films. So your first, uh, it was theatrical with Legend of Ben Hall, wasn't it? So, Yeah, it had a limited yeah. theatrical release in Australia in at, in very late 2016, um, which was you know, which was fantastic. It was uh, it started as a, I mean, I had written the script of, of Ben Hall around 2008, but in 2014, I was getting a bit restless and wanted to make another feature and every feature I was trying to get off the ground, just we just couldn't get the money for it. So I decided to run a, a Kickstarter campaign to make a short film about Ben Hall and kind of take uh, the last, you know, 20 pages of my Ben Hall script and make that as a short film. And that Kickstarter campaign was hugely successful. So, yeah, that... Um, that sort of allowed us to spend a bit more money on it because we got more money than we were anticipating. And after I shot that, I got interest to make um, in, in making it the full feature version of it. So um, it all just, that was sort of like a project that spiraled and just kept going. And, you know, I suddenly found myself with the opportunity to direct a feature of it and yeah, it got picked up for distribution here and it's been shown in lots of countries all around the world. And been on Showtime in America, HBO in Europe. So yeah, it was um, it was quite quite amazing to see that project sort of take off like that. Yeah, no, I saw the because uh, you have these lovely uh, documentaries making of behind the scenes stuff, which um, on both the cost and yeah, Legend of Ben Hall, and yeah, it's a it's an incredible process seeing how it developed and it just the snowball effect of hey, this is now a big thing, and here's the cast, and here's how we're doing it, and. I, I like how it was, how you broke down all that kind of stuff in the making of, especially how your casting choices for Ben Hall was, we want to get guys who look like the actual people. We want to get as like authentic to the time period. Yeah. That yes. Was, that yeah. was a big, that was a big goal of ours. Um, yeah. And, you know, we had, um, you know, great people come on board like Greg McLean as an executive producer. And, you know, I learned a lot of, from him and talking to him. So yeah, I think with every project I do, you know, you, you, you meet new people and you learn more things and mm. yeah, so it's, you know, you never stop learning. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and I guess we can jump to the cost as well, because that was a very recent feature. That was what uh, got me into your work, because obviously you'd, you'd commented on one of my videos um, saying that you'd made the film and I was like, oh, like I looked into it, found it at JB and there it was. And I, I had never <laughs> heard of it, which... I don't think it's a bad thing exactly because there's a lot of films I've never heard of that I still have on the shelf that I haven't watched. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, that was a, an interesting find and quite an interesting process for making through COVID and whatnot. Yeah, it was. Um, it was, and again, uh, after Ben Hall, I was trying to get a number of film projects off the ground, and just every time the the projects kept falling over. You know, or we just couldn't get the money, and and the years were ticking on, and um, and I swore I'd never do another independent, no budget film, um, but 
you know, some friends encouraged me to just get on with it and make another movie. So the cost was written to be as sort of as low budget as we could, we could get and still make something good. So, um, but yeah, it, 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 it's a shame that it, it, you know, when it came out, you know, this year that it didn't get, you know, more sort of press behind it, it didn't get more advertising behind it, but that's just kind of the reality at the moment for Australian in, independent movies. They're really hard to get out there. They're really hard to get people to, to support them. And I've had to really work hard to get it out there. That's why I, you know, I sort of trawl through the, through the internet and YouTube and I look for people like yourself who are, you know, clearly movie fans and movie lovers and are sharing that love with the world. And I contact them and try to, you know, let them know about it because, you know, you'll spread it to other movie lovers. Yeah. And it's a great, it's a great organic sort of, you know, groundswell, ground roots way of getting the films out there. And I think a lot of the time it could be more effective than just trying to reach the masses through conventional yeah. ways. Yeah, no, definitely. No, I no Cause especially after I've been thinking a lot about Australia in terms of making films, especially cause that new uh, Eric Banner film had just come out and we're, we're both actually friends of that uh, uh, film critic, Nadine, who was talking about it. And ah, uh, yes, uh, yes, yeah. And it was interesting seeing obviously her thoughts, but also the discussion about the state of like Australia in terms of where it's focusing its money on budgeting and making movies yes. and whatnot, especially for our own homegrown th features that aren't just oh, here's the special effects department in Brisbane doing Marvel films and whatever else in Melbourne doing DC films, whatever it be. But yeah, so it's. Interesting, but um, I yeah, mean, it's still great, you know, someone like you making your films. Yeah, yeah. It, it is, it is interesting, and you know, it's one of those things we're always, as filmmakers and as, as all of us in the industry, we're always fighting, um, to sort of get more money and to get more recognition and get more local stories up there. But it's uh, there's just so many complications and so many gatekeepers. It's great for film crews and like people working in the industry that we get all these American projects in because you know crew and cast and people like that they get to work on these big american films but they're not australian and they're not you know the people the australian creators aren't getting a great great deal of yeah. attention and opportunity you know and uh, in america they just pump you know they can pump these films out and you know year after year and most australian directors like myself we only really get a film done once every seven years that's the average and that's not a lot, um, you know, that means we're not really practicing our craft. We only get to sort of do this once every seven years. So we don't get to have that, um, you know, we don't, we're not, you know, honing our skills as fast as the Americans are. Mm. And we're not doing it over and over and over. And of course, the more you do something, the better you get at it. And in America, these, you know, these directors, you know, they're churning out content so quickly that they're really, you know, getting really sharp at it. And we really need that kind of turnover in Australia and Australian content creators to be making things at that kind of level and well, that kind of rotation in order to really, you know, get up there with, with the Americans in terms of content quality and so on. Yeah, I've noticed there's a lot of Australian directors who, one of my favourites, uh, Shirley Barrett, who did uh, Love Serenade, she mostly did TV. Because, like, movie-wise, yeah. there wasn't always a big opportunity and whatever, but there was obviously no, there isn't. a lot of TV in Australia. Yeah, well, as, as someone once said, I think in the 60s or 70s, they said the Australian, Australia doesn't have a film industry. It has a television industry, but it doesn't really have a film industry. We seem to have a lot of films being made with a, life, with a film life support system, and, you know, and it's hanging on by a life support system. But the industry, mm, no, we don't really have one. But TV is pretty regular in Australia and there seems to be infrastructure and funding for those. And, yeah, a lot of Australian directors who'd much rather be making movies just so they can make a living go into television, like Greg McLean's directing lots of series for Stan and Netflix right now. He hasn't made a feature in quite a few years, which is a real shame. Um, I mean, it's great that he's working in TV, but I know Greg's heart lies in cinema. Yeah. So, um it's just, you know, it really is just the way it is. So, and it's, it's one of those problems I'm facing now as I, as I look to the years ahead and what am I going to do? Am I going to keep going along this feature film route as it, as it gets harder and harder every year, it doesn't get easier. 
Um, or am I going to, you know, try to get my foot into TV? So I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. I was going to ask if you had the interest for TV. Because I, I don't like to think of it as like a, the lesser art form. But obviously, yeah, if, if you've got the cinematic eye, I prefer making cinema the feature film feel and every the budget and whatever. But, I mean, TV is not the worst option to go down the worst avenue. No, I, I think TV, I mean, there's some amazing TV, really. But again, like all things, I don't. I sort of personally feel like I don't make films sort of for the, for the sake of it. I have to be, it's a lot of work. It's a really hard job. So if I don't genuinely love what I'm doing or love the content that I'm directing, if I'm just sort of rocking up every day and just telling people what to do and I'm just sort of ticking the boxes and going through the motions, it's not, it's not really a, a job I'm Yeah. interested in. It, it, I had to really believe in it. So if it was a TV series I loved, I would, Of course, I'd be all over it, but it was, you know, I ha I do have a an original series called The Bush Rangers that um, I'm trying to get financed at the moment. You know, I've planned out four seasons of it, um, but again, it's just really hard to get the money for it. So something like that, I would be all over. But if someone was like, "Can you direct two episodes of Jack Irish or something?" I'd be like, oh, "Do I have to? <laughs> you know, can I do something else? Is it, can we make a movie?" Um, so yeah. Mm. yeah no no I get the feeling um I guess I should I get an idea of your personal tastes to get an understanding Yep. of what cinema you kind of love um Yep. and obviously ask the stupid question but do you have a favorite movie <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, I I do. Uh, I have so many favorite movies. I couldn't. I I really. I mean, for me personally, I can tell you my favorite director is Peter Weir. So he's. Peter Weir is kind of the director that if I want to aspire to somebody or look up to a filmmaker in their sort of their sentiment and their style and the, and the caliber of their work, it's probably Peter Weir. Um, I just love his films, you know, Master and Commander, Gallipoli and so many others. Um, I tend to like films that are historical, you know, I love last of the Mohicans and, um, Things like that. So, you know, war and westerns and and historical epics probably are my amongst my favorite genres. You know, followed by sci fi and things like that. Um, but yeah, I um I have so many favorites. It's hard to define. I could probably just crane my neck and turn around and I just start naming titles and I wouldn't stop. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that tends to be where where my favorites lie. Um, I tend to like films that. sort of between the 70s and the 90s the most that seems to be where most of my favorites land like you know between 2000 and 1972 they tend to fall into that range i mean I, I find the more and more i see of modern cinema i find less and less i like um there's some great ones that come out but they feel like they're the exception to the rule not the rule so um Yeah, I sometimes feel that as well. Yeah. I, I find myself constantly going into the past, searching for movies I might have missed um, because I find so little that inspires me in the modern landscape of the last, especially of the last five years. It's been a real drought. Um, I've been a, I'm a massive cinema guy. I constantly want to go to the cinema. Like I'd go every week if I could. But there's just honestly not enough films that I want to see being released in cinemas anymore that I probably went to the cinema three times last year. Um, to see different, I saw my own film, The Cost, probably like 15 times in the cinema. But um, Yeah. as far as seeing new content in the cinema, I went three times. And I was, sometimes I'd, go, I'd say to, you know, my wife, like, let's go, let's go to the movies tonight. What's on? And you look at the seven movies that are playing and you just go, I um, would never watch any of those. So it's been a, it's been a, yeah, frustrating It's frustrating from that perspective at the moment because I think cinema is really struggling to pull out the good ones. Mm. Mm. I guess on Have the flip you seen? side of hmm? no, go. No, was that what's on the flip side? <laughs> I was going to say on the flip side, you've got physical media, which obviously is a grand thing to Well, that's right. enjoy. I that Yeah. I um I I buy a lot and watch a lot on that. That's so uh, which Hmm. is which is good. Um, I haven't seen the drive to yet. Um, so I ha I can't comment on it's on what that's like and so on. And I should be careful about commenting on other, you know, contemporary Australian directors and their work publicly. Um, I like the dry, 
the original. I thought that was that was a really solid movie. Yeah, no, I liked um, it. Yeah. So I, um, you know, I'm sure I'll get around to seeing it. But yeah, I remember I, from what I've read so far, it's a bit mixed. Yeah, it's it's not a. I wouldn't say it's a bad film. It's just as a potential for a sequel, it's like it doesn't live up to what it could have been. It could have been something a lot different. I'm I'm the kind of guy who, when mm. you look at a sequel, I'm like, I want something different. I want to see a different. Not just a different landscape. Obviously, this is a rainforest instead of a desert. But like, yeah, something that narratively, character-wise, works differently, which this film doesn't have as strongly. It's still got great performances and it's still well directed and whatnot. But yeah, it's just yeah, it was yeah, fun. We watched it. We saw yeah, premiere. It was fun. <laughs> yeah, good sequels tend to honor the original, do better than it, but somehow twist it or flip it, um, mm. and do something or change up the genre or flip the flip the narrative around or something um to mm. really that they're, they're the ones that tend to excel um but you know it was you know it was encouraging when the dry did so well and, and in the in the cinema and and it did mm. suddenly it felt like oh uh australian audiences interested in australian content again could this be happening mm. but i feel it was a bit of an, an anomaly of the of covid and a lack of Hollywood and people just wanting to go out and see something for for something to do different. So I think it was a bit of a lightning in a bottle in that in that sense because all the three Australian films, are like I think Penguins and or something about Penguins with Naomi Watts came out around the same time and that did really well as well. But since yeah. then, most Australian films, you know, it's so hard. I remember running the when I had the cost, I did a small limited number of screenings for the cost that I organised. Um, just trying to get people in to see get Australians in to see Australian movies, man, it's hard. Mm. You just can't persuade persuade them to come to the cinema. So to see Australian made content, there's still a little bit of too much cultural cringe, I think. I mean, I, I like it because especially when I watched The Cost, I was like immediately, because I didn't actually, know, I don't think I even realised it was set in Australia before I put it on. And so when I was watching it, oh, okay. I know that place. Oh, I've I've been. Oh my! Like I was recognizing so many places, and I don't. Yeah. On the odd occasion with a lot of American films that are shot in, especially Melbourne, it's like, oh, like Predestination. That's definitely in Melbourne mm. because uh, no other country has bluestone, you know, pathways yes. like we do, or you know, like what was that other Australian film? The um. The knowing. Uh, it, the which one? The knowing was shot in Melbourne. I think the the oh, yeah. the Alex Proyas film that was shot in Melbourne. Yeah, Predestination. You're right. That yeah. Was this upgrade was was thinking that was like yes, you know, half that Australian great cast film. shot in Melbourne, and I could tell even though it was like whatever, like San Francisco in the future or whatever bullshit. I'm like, no, that's Melbourne. I know, you know. Yeah. But it's like watching the cost. I was like, because it's actually set there, like. The people are Australian. Everything about it is Australian. I'm like, this is fun because it's so different to actually watch people with my own native accent or more Australian yeah. accent than my own, you know, talking in a movie. I'm like, oh, this is cool. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's the bush. It's walk, great, you know? walking, walking down streets that you know and things like that. Yeah. yeah I guess in that it's... sense, it kind of puts Australian audiences like in, in, into that world pretty quickly. But yeah. Yeah. Because I know that a lot of American audiences, I've, I've a friend of mine who's in New York, he sees a bunch of New York films and sees them and he's like, you can't go from that street to that street. It's the other side of the city. And I'm like, yeah. when I'm watching Australia, I'm like, you can go from that street to that street because you just can. I know that place, you know? So it's, yep. it's, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. It is good. Um, so there you go. A, a homegrown film for all the Melbourneites. Get, go and see the costs and you'll, you'll see somewhere that you recognize. I've had so many people yeah. recognize Croydon Main Street when they've, when they've seen it, you know, they've gone, I know that Croydon Main Street, right? And like, mm. wow, how do you guys know this? But there you yeah. go. No, it was like with watching Ben Hall as well, because I like, I like Australian landscapes, like as you were saying with Peter Weir, like I love Picnic at Hanging Rocks, the landscape yeah. shots and everything. And yeah, the way you, especially how you capture that in Ben Hall, I'm like, damn, this is a good looking country. <laughs> There's nothing yeah, out there, is. but it looks great, you know? So it's, yeah. it's, it's really it's nice ruggedly to see, yeah. be ruggedly beautiful. And, yeah. um, yeah, and no, that comes up well. I do, I do tend to prefer things that are set, like Twin Rivers is all set, a shot in South Australia, but it's being Victoria, New South Wales. It's mm. standing in for it. But it's all about the lands Australian landscape. So most of the films that I make or am trying to make all tend mm. to be set in the Australian landscape. 
it's probably yeah. the 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 thing that keeps repeating in all of my films is 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 that and even the cost even though i really didn't intend it to be like consciously when writing the cost it was really more about this dramatic situation but you know just the beautiful location that we had for the cost just ended up becoming this whole it just became this really location centric movie with this with all these amazing trees and ferns and stuff so that was sort of a bit of a happy byproduct not something that we really planned as much so cuz you're yeah you're native adelaide is adelaide in a word uh Yes, well, it, we use that. We use that, that word. Yep, Adelaidean. <laughs> I'm so, so I'm used back. to Melburnian. Then I'm like, you know, Melburnian, just... Adelaidean, yeah. and uh, I was Melburnian for 13 years, but I've just recently moved back to Adelaide. So, yeah, uh, I know the timing yeah, but... of that was like ridiculous. Like, damn, he was in I the know. state. I could have filmed him. <laughs> That's right. Well, we were you were literally one week or well, one week off. But anyway, yeah, that's all right. I still appreciate the, the Zoom call. It's fun, you know. Gets more of a personal side, especially with the shelf behind you. It's not just, hey, look at my exactly. stuff behind me. You know, it's you know. That's right. You yeah. get to see mine as well. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know. uh, I guess because we're still on note of, of Blu-rays. How was it a difficult scenario to get your films onto Blu-ray, especially with Ben Hall and the cost? Uh, no, it wasn't. Um, with um, with the Legend of Ben Hall, that was distributed by Pinnacle Films, and they had it you know, sort of pegged, you know, for a Blu-ray release from the beginning. Uh, yeah. And they also did the limited theatrical run for it as well. So, um, but they, so I knew a, a Blu-ray was coming, but I was ve- I was the one that was very, very, um, I wouldn't say pushy, but I was very insistent on all the special features. Yeah. So they didn't ask for them or demand them or or, or have, you know, contractual expectations, but I was very much... You know, I'm going to make you this great big documentary and I wanted this on and I want two commentaries. And then, so I was very much the person who organized and assembled and put all those makings up together because making these films, especially the way I had to make them, which is very low budget, very independent, they end up being the story of how we get them made is usually quite um, incredible because it's not the normal way. Like, oh, you know, Fox paid for it, you know. So um, I sort of do it to sort of honor the, all the hard work that we put into it. And so all the cast and crew can sort of, you know, be acknowledged for how this movie even came into existence. And so that's why I'm very insistent on creating these, all these special features and having commentaries and things like that, because I think they provide, you know, they're not only entertaining, but they're also going to provide a good insight into the film. And also maybe other filmmakers are going to be able to watch it, learn it, get encouraged and realize, oh, wow, that's how, what they did to get there. Yeah. So they can maybe, you know, it's sort of encourage them that, you know, maybe they can do the same thing. Yeah. No, no, I, I definitely like them. They're very, yeah, exactly. Like you were saying informative and educational and whatnot. So it was, yeah, it was nice seeing the different avenues, especially for both films and how you, yeah. I tend to like those kind of making ups myself. I don't really like the ones where everyone's just sort of rubbing each other's back and going, mm. oh, we all had so much fun and yeah. we're all brilliant and we're all geniuses <laughs> and, and everyone's a genius. I'm like, nah. Let's let's go right down to reality and let's just show everyone how hard and difficult this is because yeah. that's a more interesting story. So I just try to get real and, you know, show everyone the mud and blood behind it, not, you know, rather than a bunch of, you know, self-promoting stuff. So it's a lot yeah. more fun that way. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Uh, do you, uh, I was going to say, do you have an Australia, a favourite Australian film, but you've got Peter Weir up there, so I'm like, that's a whole... It's a whole range yeah. of films that you got. Yeah, I think I think the Gallipoli would have to be one of my all-time favorite Australian films. Um, mm. Man from Snow River, definitely as well. Um, so I think yeah, you can probably see influences of Snow River and, and Gallipoli in um, in in most of my films. So they they would be my favorite Australian movies. What are your thoughts when it comes to uh, your future projects? Because I imagine you've got like heaps of ideas like oh i've got this here's a script like do you come up with the idea try to pitch it or do you just like write the screenplay how do you try to process just try uh, well i've got i've got a lot of screenplays written i mean um i figured out of all the screenplays that i've got unproduced if i made if i started making them today and i made one every three years i've got enough films to keep me going till i'm 70 so I've got plenty of films. <laughs> I've got plenty of scripts. Most of them will never get made. But um, 
it's sort of, I sort of try to have as many projects ready to go as possible. So, you know, I've got a horror, I've got a crime thriller, and I've got uh, another, hist I've got a World War II film, and I've got a Bush Ranger series. So I tend to have a lot of these scripts all sort of lying about ready to go. And, um, you know, hopefully as, as my career goes on, I get to make more movies. I'll, um, and at different budget levels, I can sort of pull out and go, well, hey, look, if you're offering me a hundred million dollars, I've got a remake of Jason the Argonauts right here. You know, so it, it's um, it really, you know, but if I know I've only going to get two million dollars, well, it's like, well, well, let's do this little horror or let's do this little crime thriller. So, you know, and um, as I come up with new ideas, I've, I'll just write them, you know, and yeah. put them in the drawer ready for a, ready for the day that they want to get born. So yeah. that's sort of how I, I work. They're sort of never, never ending constantly writing, constantly developing new projects and they all sort of overlap and each other. And yeah, it's never just sort of make one, finish one, move right next one, move, you know, yeah, it's an on, it's a, it's a very organic garden of ideas that are constantly at different stages. Yeah. Um, is it fun and easy to shoot in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> Almost seems like an obvious question of, yeah, no, it isn't. Uh, especially after seeing the cost, yeah. It's neither fun nor easy. Uh, mm. No, uh, yeah, I don't make films because they're, they're fun to make. Um, in the process of it, it's not fun. And, um, and I don't do it because it's easy. And I certainly don't do it because you get a lot of money, that's for sure. So anyone thinking I'll become a filmmaker because I'll get rich, well, you, you're an idiot. Um, no, it's neither. But it's, you know, when, when the filmmaking books are in you as a creator that there's nothing else you want to do and and even though it's always hard it all it all feels right and makes sense when I'm doing it so yeah it's kind of like it's a hard job but I feel like I'm made for the job so yeah I feel like I'm where I'm meant to be um I spend most of my time though trying to raise money to make films and I actually do making movies yeah. You know, you get a very small window of a few weeks to shoot a movie and then you get a few months to put it all together and putting it all together, that's probably the most fun part, putting it all together and then releasing it. That's where the fun is. But the prepping it, finding money, you know, pre-production and then shooting, that's all hard work. And I spend most of that time just chasing money, often yeah. that never comes. So that's the um, that's the difficult uh, part of it. So, yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not fun. But it's my calling, so what am I going to do? <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, artistic rewards are painful, to say the least, yeah. Yeah, they are. And, you know, it, 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 filmmaking is a hugely difficult process just because of the nature of the beast. It's expensive. You need a lot of people. You're dealing with a lot of technology. There's a lot of, um, a lot of money at risk. And it's just, you know, it's just a really difficult thing to do. And it's also a craft that takes a long time to to learn. And I know a lot of people you know, criticize film or they say people should do better or, you know, but it's, you know, there's just so many factors that can, you know, derail a movie in no time, despite everyone's best intentions, you know, and often, like I often say, making Ben Hall was like trying to do an oil painting in, a, in the middle of a, uh, a hurricane, you know, mm. it, you know, you can paint really, really well, but if you're standing there getting battered by the elements, your painting's going to get affected. So it's usually yeah. not so much about the talent of who you've got around you and what your own talent is, but what are the outside factors that are hammering you and how that's going to ultimately shape or disfigure what you're doing. And you just have to learn to be able to create in those kinds of less than um, satisfactory uh, environments. Because obviously Ben Hall was one of those classics uh, as in the documentary making of, you mentioned how it was like, oh, we've already got the Bush Ranger story about Ned Kelly, which was one that you had wanted to do initially. Um, yeah. And hence you did the research, found about Ben Hall, connected the dots, made the film. What inspired you to do The Cost? Um, the Cost, that really just came about because twofold, I had to come up with something that would only really entail two or three characters in an, in, a, in a sort of an isolated and single environment. So that was my parameters. Yeah. But I really wanted to explore um, the concept of uh, revenge, which is so common in movies, but I wanted to explore it in a way that was very different to what we'd seen before. 
So a lot of revenge being something that's usually glorified or seen as cathartic or positive in movies. Uh, I sort of wanted to look at it from a could like, what if this really happened? What would it really, what would, what would a revenge scenario look like to an ordinary person, not an SAS soldier or an ex cop or something like we always see in the movies, but just ordinary people. If they did went out and did this and that was the, um, which I didn't feel I'd seen too much of in cinema. So I sort of thought, ah, here's a little bit of a new thing. Other films have touched on it, but I thought I could play with it completely. Um, Because you're always looking for something sort of different. And I thought also the the intensity and the moral ambiguity and the challenge of it would also be the kind of film that people could sit up and take notice of. Because as a filmmaker, you're always looking for a film that people will, that will grab people's attention to sort of, slap them in the face going don't watch that marvel movie watch this one you know so you've got to have content that's going to grab their attention yeah so that was what was behind it yeah that's good i'm curious because obviously you've made films in australia would you consider making films abroad yeah absolutely i would consider making films abroad um you know i hope to one day be able to shoot movies abroad um though i've i have um i really don't want to work for hollywood though i've really come to that conclusion over the last few years i really want to don't want to be involved in the hollywood system of um how they make films the and the process and the people i just don't want to do that it's no longer yeah. an ambition i thought it was but it, it's i've learned too much to know that i don't want any part of it um i want to remain an independent filmmaker as long as i can and that means I uh, that means I have to make films mostly in this country and mostly you know under a certain budget level. So be it. Um, but you know I really hope that you had the opportunity that one of these projects will take me abroad. Um, I just don't think that it's you know to work under a studio system and be mandated and essentially run by a bunch of executives that will tell you what to do and how to do it. And you're really you're not. It's not your vision. It's not your stuff it's 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 what they want and you're just the yeah. guy that does it on the day it's it's what hollywood's become um there are some fortunate people in in hollywood that get to sort of make their their films the auteurs you know people that make films like there will be blood the, you know but they're again they're the exception they're not the rule yeah so yeah I'd, um but i do also really love australia as a place to make movies i love the landscape i love the you know this is so much here to tell and there's so many stories I've got to tell here in Australia. I don't see any reason why I need to go. Um, I just really wish that the Australian audiences would get behind those kinds of movies and go see them a bit more often. So I'm always thinking about how do I tell movies set in Australia, but make them more appealing to overseas audiences. Yeah. I guess we can talk about, audience responses to your films. I mean, you've obviously, as you said, you sell the cost 15 times in the cinema. Was that with different audiences to get different reactions and stuff like that? Yeah. I like, um, I, I, I like sitting in on theatrical audiences with my movies. Mm. They are an excellent way to learn, um, what you're doing that's working or not working as a filmmaker. Yeah. So, um, I know a lot of filmmakers, will say, oh, I never watch my movie once I've done it, or I never sit with audiences, and I think, mm, you're missing out on a good opportunity to learn um, because you'll hear when the jokes land or don't land. You'll see how they're responding to the, you know, to the to the drama. Are they are they getting restless because they're bored? Is this scene dragging too long? And, you know, so you, you actually start learning as a, as a director and an editor to where things go. So... No, I actually really like it. And it's also rewarding. I mean, I work so hard for this stuff and I dream and imagine and live with this stuff for years that when you finally get to present it to an audience, you know, to to have everyone in the audience gasp and shriek at the right moment, you know, for something that you spent years working on, you know, that's satisfying because then you go, yes, I got them. That's exactly what I wanted because I make these things not for myself. I make them for the audience. So um to me it's all it's it's all about how, what the, how the audience feel about it so it's very important to me how an audience feels about my film but at the same time you've got to also grow a really thick skin because no matter what you do there'll always be someone that doesn't like your work and there'll always be people that will criticize and 
tell you that you stink and and especially on the, in the online world it gets pretty nasty so yeah it's um you have to grow a thick skin and also be learn to be um confident in what you do and not take on too much so you both want the audience response and you you know love the audience but you've also got to sometimes you know learn to be resilient to it because sometimes it will be really it'll, it will be very hurtful Yeah, I've noticed that you've got obviously your your Tim Turn Pictures uh, YouTube channel for one thing, which is how you found me initially. But you've also on Facebook and whatnot. Um, it, it's it's interesting to see how you've reached out to different people about your films, like on the JBI Five page on Facebook. It's like, hey, look, it's me and my film. And like, it's Yep. it's such a cool thing to to see, especially as I would say an aspiring filmmaker. God knows if I've given up my dreams yet. I don't know, but um, yeah, it's it's. It's interesting seeing that and seeing how you're re reacting with other audiences, especially online and whatnot. Yeah, it's yeah, I feel like it's just part of what I got to do, you know. Um Yeah. and especially in the beginning stage, I don't have that, that team. I don't have the big publicity team behind me and all that. So If I want to get my film out there, I have to do as much of it as I can myself. So, you know, engaging with the audience is a really big, important thing for me. Um, and I know that was part of why, my, what made Ben Hall really successful, starting as the, you know, with this crowdfunded short film. And, you know, the reason that it got out there as much as it did is because I engaged with the audience very early, even before we had made the film and all through the making of the film and then afterwards. And uh, so I saw the power of that. of engaging with the, with your audience, especially if you're making something that's got a bit of a niche kind of, you know, interest for people like bush rangers do. So yeah, I, um, and it's fun, you know, it's fun to, like I said, you make it, you make it for other people. So it's fun to get people out there and, and learning about your work and seeing what they say and seeing what they respond to and, and all that, and, you know, and you, you, and you just take the little knocks along the way when it, they don't respond to it so well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where can audiences find your films? The best, uh, well, to the cost uh, is available on Apple Plus, um, Amazon Prime, you know, YouTube Movies, Google Play, those kinds of um, streaming video on demand. It hasn't got, it's not on, it's not available on a streamer yet, like for free, but we're working on it. Uh, and of course, you can get it on DVD and Blu-ray on, you know, wherever they sell them these days and um, online and you know, eBay and stuff like that. Um, same with Ben Hall, uh, that is available. Actually, Ben Hall is actually available on, um, SBS on demand at the moment for free. So anyone in Australia can jump on and watch it anytime they want for free on SBS on demand. And it's been really good because, um, it's been pretty dormant that film for a while. It's really only been available on some video on demand sites and of course, DVD and Blu-ray, but when, once it hit, SBS on demand and suddenly everyone in Australia could watch for free in their home anytime they wanted. It's seen a real resurgence in interest and a huge amount of audience and people are, are seeing it that never even knew the film existed, which has been great. And the, you know, the Facebook page is, you know, got nearly 2000 more likes and it's more, it's got even more interaction than it's ever had. So it's, it's been good seeing the film sort of re researched. And of course, my first film, Twin Rivers, is available on um, Amazon Prime. Well, it was available on Amazon Prime. I'm not sure it is anymore. Um, but yeah, it's video on demand. If you search for it, it'll turn up. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I obviously as a physical media collector, with there's always the argument with in a bunch of my videos, I'll have comments of people saying how they hate streaming, they prefer buying physical and stuff. But especially as someone like you being a you know independent filmmaker and not getting such a huge release for your films, obviously like streaming is a huge plus on the odd occasion. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's I. I mean, again, I'll, I'll be one of those people that says I don't like streaming. I don't. Um, I tend to, if I want something, I'll buy it and I'll Yeah. keep it and like that. I, I see the benefit in in what in some streaming because you know you want to watch a documentary and things like that. I think it's got its place. I just hate how it's become the. It's just become where everything is now, and then and, and people seem to only go for that. And then what happens? is that if the movie's not on there, it loses, at least in the public eye, it loses, um, it, it vanishes from people's sight. They only watch what pops up on the Netflix 
thing. And often a lot of all the titles don't even show up there anyway. Not So I have a problem with the way streaming is laid out and set up and, and, and how people, it's really narrowing people's uh, options, whereas the video store didn't limit anybody's options, you know, what was it? Blockbuster and Movie Land was usually the same movies, and you had everything, and so you could go in, and there was you you had no limitations. But really, with streaming, you're limited to the the narrow library and the narrow window they are of the library they allow you to see based on your own personal algorithm. And so it's really just narrowing everyone down to these very few titles. And if your movie doesn't get in there, it's very hard for them to find it. And people are generally lazy, and they're not going to go looking for it. So, you know, it's um. That's what I don't like about streaming. So I, I really hope that something like the cost or the Lynch to Ben Hall would, you know, get onto one of those streamers like Stan or Binge or something like that and get put front and center and pop up on the and I think, you know, they would a lot of people would watch it and probably do quite well. But, you know, because it doesn't have Clint Eastwood in it, because it doesn't have um, you know, Johnny Depp in it, they tend to yeah. push those movies aside. So it's uh it's tricky. Yeah. It's tricky. Yeah, well, still. Um, but no, it's great. Look, it's, it's, it's wonderful that you're making films. It's, it's great to to see the Australian market still exists despite how you know almost weak and feeble it has always kind of appeared. But um, yeah, it's it's a commendable effort, especially to keep going. You know, like you could you could have given up after the first film, being like, nope, if this ain't gonna happen in the next three years, I'm done. I'm out. But no, it's it's good. I like it. It's. It's the good uh, Aussie persistence, I guess you would say. You know, like it's it's you know yeah. it's something that we have. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, that you've got to have it to exist to 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 survive. The Australian film industry becomes a uh, really just an act of sheer stubborn will. It's not mm. really anything else. You've just got to stick it out, um, because there's no other way to do it. So, you know, I don't encourage. I get like filmmakers. Oh, I'd love to be a filmmaker. I want to make it's like, mm, if there's anything else you'd rather do, do that. Mm. I usually tell them, don't do this unless your heart bleeds for it and you yeah. cannot do anything else. If it's because it's just too hard. Um, but you know, if you, if you're like me and you just, it's just in your, in your soul, then you kind of, you're, you're cursed to do it. Um, yeah. you just got to have enough stickability to, to weather the storm. Yeah, cool. Well, this has been insightful and very fun. Thank you for both reaching out and sending me one of your films and and joining me on my show. Um, no, my pleasure. Yeah. No, my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on. I hope uh, it encourages a few people to seek these two movies out, and I hope they like them. And yeah, and I uh, I like what people like yourself do. You know, you're, you're keeping physical media and and the love of movies alive. And I think the good thing about uh, now more than ever, I mean, I've been collecting movies since they were VHSs, and um, I'm actually seeing this. This is almost the more rare and the more the market shrinks. There seems to be this intensifying of collectors. Mm -hmm. There seems to be more of them coming out of the woodwork. It's like we're getting more and more stubborn and more and more passionate about collecting. The more rarer and the more narrower it becomes. So it's good. It's the yin to the yang. It's the it's the it's the action to the it's the reaction to the action. So the more they try to strip away the physical media, I think the more we'll find that it will just hang in there like a tick. So mm. I'll certainly yeah. keep buying until my and run out of room and run out of money. Yeah. No. Same. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yes. No. Definitely. Yeah. We are. We are, we we become the custodians. I like someone said the other day we're big, and I really took to earth that we are. Was it Christopher Nolan that was saying that like collectors, you are now the custodians of films? And I thought, yeah, you know what? we kind of yeah, are. We did talk about that, yeah, yeah, yeah. By buying yeah, no, he... media, we are we are not letting the studios bury it or hide it or just make it disappear into the digital ether. We are becoming custodians, and we're going to hang on to it so future generations can enjoy these movies. So um, they're, they're, they're in our hands now, which is great. Yeah. So I'm going to take that to heart. Yeah. No, I, I definitely do. So, yeah, it's always great. 
it's always it's yeah. always fun, especially because I can. I mean, obviously there's some bragging rights and whatever, but just to be able to be like, oh, you should watch this film. It's really crazy. You'll love it. You know, it's it's, it's fun to suggest and to not have to rely on the amount of times your internet will lag, especially in especially in Australia. <laughs> So, yes, yeah. exactly, with yeah. with the slowest internet in the world. Um, but, I mean, you know, the, the special features and the, you know, behind the scenes and, and mm. commentaries, I mean, these things are so valuable. I mean, I always tell filmmakers that, you know, yeah, you can go to film school. I don't ever knock film school, but you don't have to do it. Just get yourself as many Ridley Scott commentaries. Get yourself as many um james cameron commentaries you know and just put them on and you'll learn so much about filmmaking and the process of filmmaking just by listening to other directors talk and when have we ever in history had the ability to have james cameron speak for two and a half hours in our living room about how he made the movie and what the process was and what all the thoughts were behind every scene that got cut and every edit and you know that's just a gold mine so once once dvds came out and they had commentaries I absorb them like crazy. And I'd have to say that movie commentaries have been like my film school as well, as well as on my job. Movie commentaries were my film school and I applied them to my own movies. So I sort of feel like I, when I do commentaries for my own films, which I've done on every single one, even Twin Rivers, it's my way of sharing what I've learned. Mm. So it's sort of my, I'm adding now to that knowledge, that film school that someone else can use to, to make movies so yeah it's great yeah cool all right well i think we can uh wrap this up here don't want to take any more sounds good time. mate yeah no well, worries i've got to get back I've, i'm script editing a new one of my new screenplays at the moment so um and i've got to get it done by tonight so yeah yeah i've got to get back to work yeah all right well i'm look forward to your future projects and i'll obviously cherish the movies that i have of yours and i'll look for wind River yes. as well i should get that yeah wind, wind, wind yeah well it, i don't know if it's still available on uh i don't know if it's still available on ebay wind i might River. have taken it down but if twin rivers is not available you just just let me know and i'll post you one out i've got yeah. a stack of i've got a, a stack of a few left they were they're like a self-produced blu-ray they're all professionally produced but i i released them so yeah yeah but um i'll get one I'll get one to you yeah cool all right. All right, mate. Well, All the best. I look forward to when it goes online. Just let me know and I'll share yeah. the shit out of it. <laughs> awesome. Thank get you, you. Get you, see if I can get you a few more subscribers. Yeah, hopefully so. Yeah. <laughs> All right. See cool. you later. All right, mate. All the best. Ciao. Bye. Well, thank you for watching that interview with Matthew and thank you, Matthew, for your time. Um, if you want to find Matthew's work, there'll be links down below as well as to my anatomy for Blu-ray for the cost where I deep dive into the Blu-ray and its special features. Uh, yeah, you can also find other interviews that I've done on this channel of playlists on the screen and I'll link down his channel for two-tone pictures if you want to take a look at more trailers and other works for what he's doing. Uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Enjoy. Adios.